Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Keg of Knowledge, um, hosted by the Cornwall Science Community, but we can't take any credit for actually organising it. Uh, this has all been organised by the brilliant postgraduates at the University of Exeter's Penryn campus, and um, uh, I'll be passing over to Josh in a minute, who will be chairing for us this evening. Um, just to let you know, a quick bit of housekeeping, the, uh, the talks will be recorded, you probably heard the, um, the computer voice in your ear when you uh, came in. Um, telling it's being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, you can um, turn your, your camera off there. This will go up on the Cornwall Science Community YouTube channel. Um, we'll also be doing um, a series of other um, talks over the coming uh, weeks and months for the Cornwall Science Community and a few other events where we do a bit of a Cornwall Citizen Science sh Showcase in a few months' time. And if you want to hear about those, um, you can sign up to our mailing list, which I'll pop in the, um, the Zoom chat here, or you can follow us on the social media pages. Um, and I'll just be here today to offer a bit of tech support. So if anything goes wrong with that, you can blame me. Um, but that's everything for me. I'm going to pass over now to Josh. Thank you, Ben. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Ben and, on, and the Cornwall Science community as a whole for allowing us to do this event. So there's a bit of a background into this event. Um, this event is the Keg of Knowledge. And usually every year we would be taking our our merry band of scientists into a real pub to, to pull real pints from a real keg. But sadly, with the way of the world at the moment, that isn't possible. So we scratched our heads and turned to the brilliant Ben Toulson, who, who was very, very, very helpful to, um, to help us to reach all of you guys. So we're really grateful for you all for coming. And we're really excited to be able to uh, run this event at such scope as we were joking beforehand. This is by far the best keg of knowledge in terms of attendance already. So we're really grateful for all of you. Um, so why this event? So as some of you may be aware, this week and particularly this Friday will mark the 212th birthday of Charles Darwin. Um, and every year for Charles Darwin's birthday, we have a week of events where we celebrate the life of, of the man himself who's been so influential to science and especially in biology. Um, and this isn't uncommon. This happens in um, departments across the, across the UK and across the world. But we here in, in the Cornwall campus of the University of Exeter feel we have a little bit of an extra special connection to the man himself um, because as a maybe little known fact, um, at the end of the voyage of the Beagle, the ship actually landed in Falmouth Harbour itself. So Charles Darwin's first steps back onto, back onto the solid ground of, the, of England was in Falmouth itself. So we feel like we have a bit of a, an extra special connection. Um, and this voyage obviously was incredibly influential um, into science and the way we think about the natural world. Um, that voyage was influential in his... Um, formulation of the uh, theory of evolution and and the many publications and famous books such as the origin of species that came out of that um so that is the reason that that we like to celebrate and we feel that his work is so inspirational for us um and and we like to take that work and hopefully spread it a little bit further and wider so we have a, a wonderful evening of, of talks lined up we have four really interesting speakers across all different ranges um from phd students to to staff at our department and, and we really hope that it will be a, an engaging evening to try and tell you a little bit about some of the work that happens on the campus and has been largely inspired by Charles Darwin's work um, and the wider natural world. Um, so we'll have four talks, each talk will be about 10 to 15 minutes um, and then at the end of each talk there'll be some time for questions. Do please ask questions, we really want to engage as best we can. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to either write them into the chat as the talks are going on. Um, Toby will be monitoring the chat for us and pass them on to me and I can ask them to the speakers. Alternative TV, if you'd prefer to um, ask your questions to the speakers themselves, then feel free to wait till the end of the talk, put your hand up and I will come to you and you can ask the speakers directly. Um, so without any further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker for the evening. So our first speaker is Teresa Ruger, who is joining us all the way from Boston. Um, Teresa is a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow, so um, the stage above uh, after her PhD, having um, got her PhD in Australia. Uh, she studies the evolution and mating of mating and social systems in coral reef fish, and her talk is called Why Nemo Returned? The Evolution of Group Living in Coral Reef Fishes. So I'll hand over to you, Teresa. Oh, sorry, Teresa, you're muted. Rookie mistake. <laughs> Thank you, Josh, for that introduction. Thank you all for um, having me. Um, I'm in Boston at the moment, but I'm moving to 
going to move to Penryn um, in August this year. So I'm really um, excited to be part of your community. And I'll tell you a bit about the research that I'm doing with the University of Exeter, which concerns the evolution of group living in coral reef fishes. So let's start with a bit of background. Um, there's a few major transitions in the history of life. Um, if you think about uh, organisms that were only one cell becoming multicellular organisms. And another one of those major transitions in the history of life is animals that live by themselves starting to live in a group. Now, often in animal groups, um, these groups become quite complex. So you might have division of labor where everybody has their own role. And sometimes you also have division of reproduction. So only some individuals in the group um, will reproduce or have babies and others won't. They instead will help raise the babies of those that reproduce. So often we've got um, the parents, those that make the babies, We've got the children as part of um, these groups, but then we've got these other individuals which could theoretically reproduce, but they don't, they don't make babies. And that is a bit of an evolutionary mystery that even Charles Darwin first remarked on it. Um, because how would the genes spread throughout a population if they don't make babies themselves? For the sake of this talk, we'll be talking about um, the parents as breeders, so those that make babies, um, the children themselves as offspring, and those odd individuals where we don't know why they're there or why the breeders tolerate them, we'll call those non-breeders. Now, there's been some great research at the University of Exeter um, looking at this mystery. Um, people like Professor Mike Kant or Jeremy Field have been using um, animals like mongoose and paper wasps to figure out this mystery. And one of the things that they and other researchers have found is that the main driver for this kind of group living where some make babies and some don't is kin selection. And that simply means that it's better to live with close relatives. So all of those groups um, that we're talking about, mammals and birds and insects, all of them live with very close relatives. Now there's other drivers that might um, play a role here. So it might just be that living in a group is safer um, or that those non-breeders might inherit the territory later and then make babies themselves. And it could also be that group living is simply great for everybody involved because the group is better at foraging, so getting food or defending the territory. But what we still don't know about this kind of group living is how it evolves in animals where there's no relation, relatedness amongst group members. So we do see these kind of complex groups where some reproduce and some don't have babies in fish as well, for example, coral reef fish, which is what I study. Um, but here we can't rely on kin selection because those guys are not related to one another. And the question then is which one of these other drivers might play a role and which one has the central role in explaining why these fish live in groups. And to understand why um, we think that there's no relatedness amongst these groups, we'll need to look at a little bit of background knowledge on coral reef fishes. Most fish um, and most other organisms that live on coral reefs, when they hatch, um, they are first in a larval stage. So they don't actually stay on the reef itself, but first, once they hatch, they go out into the open ocean. So they have creatures that look um, a little odd like this, and they actually swim out into the open ocean. Now that seems to be a little bit counterintuitive because most of us would think of the open ocean um, as quite a scary place with lots of big predators. But if you think of it as a, from the perspective of a tiny little larvae fish, then you might see that in the open ocean where all these predators are giant, you might actually be safer than staying on the reef straight away where the predators are much smaller and much more likely to notice you. So all of those fish, those reef fish that we are familiar with seeing, the Nemos and others, they all um, do this big journey um, before they come back either to the same reef or to a different reef um, that they came from. So once they're a little larger, they settle onto a reef and look for a group to live in. But that makes it quite unlikely that they will be with their parents or their sibling, right? Because they've all been in the open ocean and for them to meet again, that seems quite unlikely. 
so to look at this mystery of why coral reef fish live in these complex groups, I am lucky enough to work with this beautiful fish, um, Amphibion percula, or the clown anemone fish, the orange anemone fish, or nemos. These fish are great um, for these kind of studies because, well, first of all, they do live in groups. Um, there's usually two to about seven of them in one anemone. So this is, this is an anemone here. Um, it's a nidarian. It's closely related to hard corals that we think of when we think of coral reefs. Um, and it's an animal that they live in a very tight relationship with. So these fish live in a size hierarchy. Um, in every single group of Nemos, the largest fish will always be the female, the second largest will always be the male, and everybody underneath that is a non-breeder. So these two make all of the babies and everybody else in the group um, is, um, is a non-breeder and doesn't make a baby. Another interesting thing about these fish is um, that they, what we call sequential hermaphrodites. So they actually do a sex change throughout their life. When this female dies, this male will become the female and this non-breeder will become the male, which has some really interesting consequences when you think about the, I don't know whether you're familiar with the movie Finding Nemo, um, but by the time that Nemo came back, Marlin would have most likely um, been a female and probably called Marlena or something like that. Now, very similar to what um, we've seen in the movie, actually, they are actually very good dads. Um, so um, clown and anemone fish lay their eggs on the bottom of the anemone. They glue them into patches onto um, this reef substrate here. And then the dads take care of them. So they aerate them with their fins to make sure that they get oxygen. They clean them with their mouths and they're altogether very good dads. And then another interesting thing about them is this very close relationship that these fish have with um, the anemone. So the fish provide nutrients and they provide protection for the anemone host. And the anemone in turn, because it has stinging cells, also provides protection um, for these fish. And the studies that I do, um, I do them in Papua New Guinea, um, in this beautiful place, it's called Kimbi Bay. Um, it's on an island. This is Papua New Guinea here. This is New Britain Island. And these are the reefs um, that I get to work on. And so my research that I'm doing with the University of Exeter is sort of looking at a couple of alternative hypotheses of why these fish might live in groups if they don't live with their parents and their siblings and their offspring. And some of the hypotheses that I'm looking at is, well, maybe they're not with close relatives, but maybe they're with distant relatives. So maybe if they do come back to the same reef, they might not come back to the same group that they're born in, but maybe they, they end up with um, close cousins and maybe that's enough to motivate them to live in these groups. Another possibility is that the non-breeders, so those who don't make babies, maybe they're accepted in these groups because they help in some other way. So it could be that they clean the anemone or they protect the anemone from predators. So they do have a useful role in these groups. And then another interesting thing to think of is what relationship, what um, role does the relationship between the fish and the anemone play in all of this? So maybe the fish live in groups because it's better for the anemone to have more fish taking care of it, um, cleaning it and um, protecting it from predators. And maybe if there's a larger anemone, that's also good for the fish. So maybe they produce more babies when they're in these larger anemones. So there could be some synergistic effects, we call it, um, happening. So to look at, look at this first hypothesis, maybe they're with distant relatives, we need to check the relatedness of all of those fish um, in the groups. And we do that by doing um, DNA fingerprinting. So I catch, this is all happening underwater because it's less stressful for the fish. So in New Guinea, I go and I catch every one of those fish from their anemones. And then I take, I actually take little scissors with me underwater and I take a tiny part of their tail. Um, now that, that sounds really invasive and it is, the fish certainly don't like it, but those tails, the tissue is more like our fingernails and our hair and it does grow back. So um, within a couple of weeks, you won't be able to tell um, that I took a little part of their tail. And it also doesn't affect their swimming ability all that much. So all of the fish, I'm sure 
they don't love me after this, um, but they're all, all fine. And then I can take those little tissue samples and I can see who is how related to each other fish in the anemone. And I can figure out, um, do they actually live with sort of their distant relatives, their second degree cousins or their great grandparents or something like that. And that might help us explain this group living. Then another thing I'm looking at is the behavior of the non-breeders and how that might help um, motivate the breeders so the big dominant fish to accept them in the group. So do they earn their keep, so to say? And we do that by filming and um, assessing the behavior of these fish. Now, when we do that underwater, um, we have scuba gear on and we're blowing these really loud bubbles. So we, when we do um, checking of behavior, we usually use cameras. So like you see here, this is the anemone that the fish live in and we've set up um, a camera um, on this reef. So we swim away and then it's quiet and the fish get used to the presence of the camera very quickly and they behave normally. And then later we can check the video and check um, how they're behaving. And then for this last hypothesis, whether um, the anemones um, somehow help the fish um, be healthier and larger groups of fish help the anemone, for that, it's a bit more of a tricky question and we have to do um, an experiment, a manipulative experiment. And we will do this in New Guinea. We were actually planning on doing this um, last year and this year, but um, COVID got in the way of it. Of course, we haven't been going to New Guinea. Um, but I'm still planning on doing this experiment and I think it'll be really fun. You can actually take these fish quite easily and put them into different anemones. So one way to find out what effect the fish have on the anemone and what effect the anemone has on the fish is to swap these groups around. So we can take the groups of fish and put them into a large anemone, for example, and we can see whether these fish will do better in the large anemone versus the anemone they used to be in. And we can put them into a small anemone and we can see whether this anemone does much better with a larger group of fish. And we can tell that they're doing better by measuring their growth. Um, so here's me doing that um, in New Guinea. So I've got my scuba gear on and my fins um, and my notepad and I'm just taking some tailoring um, tape to measure the anemone. And I'd like to point out that in this picture, these three fish are making a very valiant effort to defend the anemone from um, an intruder that is many, many times their size. So they're very brave. And another thing that I can very easily measure to tell whether the fish are doing better in larger anemones is um, look at their reproductive output. So how many babies are they making? So as I said, they glue their eggs onto the substrate underneath the anemone. And I can just take these kind of photos and count. Um, so when they first lay the eggs, um, they're these orange colored. And then after six or seven days, when they're just about to hatch and start their big journey into the ocean, um, you can see, maybe you can see these tiny eyes here staring up at us. So they're just about to start. So what I've I found so far, well, for the first um, hypothesis, are they with distant relatives? I'm still checking. We have some evidence from other reef fish that that might be the case and that might motivate them to stay in these groups. But for the Nemos, we don't quite know yet. I'm still working on it. Um, I have found that these um, smaller non-breeders, the ones that don't make babies, are actually really good group members and they do help to defend the anemone and clean it. And um, as to the relationship between the anemone and fish, as I said, I didn't get to New Guinea the last couple of years, um, but I'm hoping to strive that experiment soon. And with that, thank you all so much for listening. I'd like to acknowledge all of the, uh, all of my field and lab assistants um, and uh, my lab members and advisors and my funding bodies. And thank you all so much for listening. And I'm really looking forward to being with you um, in Penryn later this year. And um, maybe we'll have, we have time for some questions. Thank you. Awesome, absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Teresa. Um, that was fascinating. And some of those pictures are incredibly cute. Um, <laughs> so uh, whilst we, yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop your hands up in, um, in your Zoom window and I'll come to you. Um, and whilst we wait for that to happen, I have a question. Um, so I'm, I'm curious when, so these little babies, they 
they hatch and then they swim away how long are they away for and sort of what's the what's if you are if i'm a baby clownfish for instance you know what do i just get to a certain size swim back to the reef and just find an enemy and, and try and join in or what's kind of what's the process for them yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, clownfish are in the open water for three to four weeks, depending on their on the exact species. It is it is pretty different. So some fish are out there for months. Um, some fish are only out there for ten days. But clownfish, it's about three to four weeks, and they do grow when they once they come back to the reef. They're about one centimeter, so um, they have grown a lot and they have changed a lot. Um, a lot of uh, processes are working quite differently compared to when they're larvae. Um, and they're sort of in this transition stage and then they come back to the reef or they try because you have all those little wrasses and all those little predators that are trying to pick them off and they will try to find an anemone so they follow they're tiny and so you'd think that they can't they don't have much choice right they'll just be in the open ocean and in those currents but we've actually found that they're quite good at picking a current so they're in these water columns and by smell and by sound, they pick the current that they're in. Um, so they can, that's how they decide that, okay, it's time to come back to the reef. So they pick a current um, that smells right, that sounds right, um, and that can bring them back to the reef. So they're tiny and you'd think they're quite helpless, but they're actually quite good um, at doing what they do. That's remarkable. That's so cool. Um... I've got a question in the chat. So it says, uh, does this interesting system of uh, sexual size hierarchy with hermaphrodites and non-breeders happen in, in other species too? Yeah, it happens. It happens in all anemone fish. So I'm, some of you might know that Nemo's, there's lots of sister species um, that sort of look similar and they have um, this relationship with the anemone as well. But it happens in quite a lot of coral reef fish. Um, so gobies do it, um, they're these tiny um, fish that live like right within the hard corals and some fish can actually do it each way. So um, some of them are so patchy on the reef um, that once they encounter another fish, they can't be too picky. So one of them will become the male and one of them will become the female. So they're very clever like that. And there's quite a few fish that do it the other way around too. So they might be sequential hermaphrodites, but they might be females first. And then at the very end, they might be males. That's fascinating. That's, yeah, I suppose it just challenges what we think about how sex is determined in, in animals. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, cool. M Mel has a question. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, thanks, Teresa. That was a really good talk. Um, I was wondering whether you get any fish that cheat the system, so whether they wait to go up the hierarchy and change sex, or whether rather than waiting that time, they'll just go to another anemone and try and like infiltrate a different group so they can reproduce faster rather than having to wait their turn. That's a very good question. Um thought like somebody who wants to really wants to reproduce yes you'd think that that, ha that happens and it does happen in other species so there's an enemy fish species that are larger than the one i work with and they do swap anemones and they do exactly what you said so by the time they're large enough and they think they might be able to wiggle their way in and step skip a couple of steps they do that however the nemos in particular are actually once they leave their anemone um they almost immediately get eaten so they're, they're small, um, they're not great swimmers. Um, they're really good at other things, um, but they're not good at surviving outside of the anemone. So in this particular species, we've actually never seen anybody try to skip a queue or try to sneak some reproduction just because it's too risky for them. So as soon as they get kicked out, they don't want to piss off their, um, that big male or big female because they might kick them out of the group. Um, and that means almost certain death. Wow, thank you. It's a brutal world. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I think we've got time for one last question. So I've got one more question in the chat and it's from um, Sam. So it says, it says, thanks for your talk. Um, do the non-breeders to help help to raise the eggs, you know, oxygenating or cleaning them, or do they only defend the anemone? If it's the latter, it could be argued they're just defending their home and the helping is just a byproduct. Yeah, that's great. Um, very good question. And you're absolutely right. Um, it is just a byproduct. Um, they don't, so in the fish, in the meerkats and the wasps that we're talking about, they usually help raise those other 
those other babies that are produced in the group. But in fish, they don't. Um, so they, we don't see what is called alloparental care. So they don't do the aeration or the cleaning of the eggs. And you're right that the helping that I've recorded is most likely quite selfish in a way, um, but that's okay. They're still helping out. Um, they do inherit that territory, right? Um, because when the, the female dies and then maybe another couple die, then maybe they will move up to be the breeders and inherit that territory. So any sort of cleaning that they do and any help that they do for the anemone is in the end um, for their own good. And that's what makes it make sense in the context of sort of Darwin's theory of evolution. Cool. Awesome. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, if anyone has, uh, and with all the speakers tonight, if anyone has any other questions or they pop up as they go, um, feel free to either pop them into the chat and the speakers can respond to you or um, hold them to the end. And if any of the speakers have some time at the end, you can always ask them then as well. Um, wonderful. Thank you. So moving on, our next uh, speaker is Will Hawks. Will is a PhD student up at the campus. Um, and Will studies insect migration, a topic which uh, I think a lot of people either don't really think about very much or at least underestimate. And I'm sure he's about to change your mind. Uh, so Will is in the Exeter's Genetics of Migration Lab and works um, primarily with his field sites in Cyprus, recording and identifying insects as they pass through the area on their amazing migration. So I'll pass over to Will to wow you all. Hopefully, cheers Josh. Okay, so. <clears throat> um, as well as Cyprus, in fact, we also go to the Pyrenees, if I can stop doing that. And um, we're going to start this talk today by casting our minds back about 70 years and to an October 70 years ago, and high in the Pyrenean mountains. And here, two scientists named David and Elizabeth Lack were on holiday. They're both ornithologists or bird researchers, and they're just headed up to the Puerto de Bujarello, which is a mountain pass, which if you can see my cursor here, is just here in the mountains and very beautiful it is too. And they had just headed up to this pass in order to watch the migration. They'd seen hundreds of swallows, thousands of butterflies and tens of thousands of dragonflies all headed south, battling over the winds of the mountain pass. And they were up there for well over an hour before they realized that there was another migrant that they had not yet noticed. And they may have seen something akin to this. If it's playing, a multitude of tiny black dots moving purposefully south over the pass in near uncountable numbers. It's just amazing to watch these. And these are, of course, the hoverflies. David and Elizabeth Lack, they estimated that these tiny, tiny insects, some of them, or the majority, uh, measuring about 18 millimeters, were perhaps 100 times as numerous as the dragonflies. And in their 1951 paper, they described the hoverfly as the most remarkable migrants of all. Now, my name is Will Hawkes, and I'm a PhD student here at the University of Exeter, lucky enough to be studying this fascinating world of insect migration. I'm on the right here, um, looking a bit daft in short, with my um, lab mate, Rich Massey, on top of a mountain in the Pyrenees, the same site that David and Elizabeth Lack visited all those years ago. And we're currently following in the footsteps of those giants, continuing looking at the insect migration. We travel here, as well as some other beautiful places, such as Cyprus, as Josh mentioned, to study those hoverflies that the um, researchers saw 70 years ago migrating. But we also look at a myriad different insect types. This slide is just a um, brief, tiny little slither of what is migrating. So on the top left here is a painted lady butterfly. Uh, but as well, we have red admiral butterflies. Cabbage whites that you have in your garden are also migratory creatures. Moths as well, not just the day flying hummingbird hawk moths like these, they're highly migratory. Um, shield bugs, uh, you've heard about the locust plagues, plagues, of course. Ladybirds migrate, the ones that you have, you might have if you have an older house in the window corners over winter, they'll have migrated there from um, colder, colder areas tiny flies and larger flies, wasps, and even in some parts of the world, bumblebees will migrate. 
And insects are fascinating migrants for one because they are so different to birds. Insects are multi-generational migrants, which means unlike birds, for example, a swallow, they will not complete the north to south to north again migratory loop as a single individual. Rather, in the Northern Hemisphere, at least, insects will move north over four or five generations, following the green wave of spring as the flowers bloom progressively further north. And then in late summer or early autumn, a single generation of insects will make the often huge journey back south. And interestingly, because the insects are multi-generational, when they get into an area they want to lay their eggs, the adults will lay them and then the adults will die leaving their offspring to develop without ever having their parents to learn from or experienced migrants to follow on their migratory journey. And this means that the entire migratory behavior of these insects, where to go, how to get there, etc., has a genetic instinctive basis. But how do they know where to go? Well, new research from Rich, as you saw earlier in my lab, shows that hoverflies and other day flying migrants will use the sun as a compass to orientate themselves as they fly. And this means that they must calculate the sun's position relative to where they want to go continually throughout the day as the sun moves across the heavens, something complicated for today's pilots to do. And insects um, up to about three millimeters long and almost certainly smaller when we discover even smaller migrants can do this, truly remarkable. And at night, moths like this death's head hawk moth here will use the moon or maybe even the Milky Way to migrate an informed direction. And vaguely similar to Teresa earlier, the, with, the, um, <clears throat> with the clownfish, all insects will actively use winds in the same way as ocean currents. They will choose favorable winds to migrate in order to save energy, they'll give an extra boost so they can create, they can complete such huge distances. And the distances really are impressive. So we don't know exactly where they're going, but because we do not yet have GPS trackers small enough to fit on an insect, but we can make educated guesses. On the far left of here, we have the root of the monarch butterfly in the autumn. And I'm sure you all know the monarch butterfly is this amazing creature which over winters down here in California or in Mexico, and then moves right up to North America over a series of generations before a single individual comes back not south again. And, uh, but my own research is slowly re revealing that insects in Northern Europe, such as a marmalade hoverfly or the cabbage white butterfly, red admirals, moths, will fly down from Northern Europe across the plains get channeled by the Pyrenees because it's the, the, they can't fly over the 3000 meter high peaks. They get channeled by the steep sided valleys. And so people like us and David and Elizabeth Lack can stand on these valleys and catch the insects as they go over. And then they continue south, potentially judging by climatic data and the best place for the insects to overwinter is potentially in the Sahel region of sub-Saharan Africa huge, huge distances for such tiny insects. We also think that a lot of insects like the common drone hoverfly will make it into Europe from the Middle East um, in the springtime, potentially developing in, in areas like the Mesopotamian marshes in Iraq, the supposed location of the biblical Garden of Eden cities, uh, hoverflies of Eden coming in. And there are also other routes such as the ones going down this, the eastern seaboard of the United States and into South America through, through Venezuela, as well as reports of dragonflies following storms up the bottom of Argentina. But all of these pale in comparison when you compare it to the globe skimmer dragonfly. And this is a really beautiful little creature. It's so well adapted to, uh, to long distance flight. Its wings are really, really wide and so it allows it to glide on the, on, the, on the winds, allowing it to have huge distances. And research, recent research has suggested that this creature potentially spends its summer in the Southern Ural Mountains, or at least into Middle Asia, Kazakhstan, places like that. And then following the monsoon rains um, and monsoon, and the, the, it will travel south into India 
and then following the monsoon rains and the winds that the monsoon system creates, it will cross the Indian Ocean and continue its life cycle in the African monsoon season, a distance of 10,000 kilometers, which is incredible considering it cannot land on the entire sea crossing. And insects migrate for a variety of reasons, usually to find spaces where they can just continue their life histories, continue to find plants which their larvae need to grow um, or find habitats for their larvae need to develop in. So for example, this dragonfly uses <clears throat> the monsoon to, to because it needs puddles to lay its eggs in. And because in puddles, there are very rarely predators. And so if the dragonfly lays its eggs in the puddle, then the larva will likely survive. And it's got round the issue of there being a dry season by simply migrating with the monsoon, despite it being thousands and thousands of kilometers long. And 10,000 kilometers is a sin single one-way trip. So they may all be a 20,000 kilometer trip all the way back up. It's just absolutely remarkable, remarkable insects. Now, while the distances are, distances are impressive, the numbers these insects are moving in are almost equally so. In just a single Pyrenean pass where we do our research, we have counted nearly 7 million individuals moving through in just a single autumn. In the springtime in Cyprus, we counted over 50 million individuals coming across the sea into Europe from the Middle East. And this is no small distance. They're covering a distance of 108 kilometers in a single day. But <clears throat> both of these studies were done with rudimentary ground level techniques. So I went there with a camera trap to count the insects going through and um, as well as my insect net. But radar techniques are beginning to reveal the true extent of these numbers. The, these entomological radars, these insect radars, work by firing a beam up into the sky and counting, as well as identifying the shape of the insects flying overhead. And using a series of these entomological radars across just southern England, my, one of my PhD supervisors, Dr Jason Chapman, counted a massive three and a half trillion insects migrating overhead in just southern England, remember, every single year. And while the numbers and the roots are very interesting and no doubt impressive, it is the species and the roles that these migratory insects play that make them so vital for our planet. My main finding from my PhD so far is, is that the flies, which are by far the most numerous of all the different insect types, so not just hollow flies, all types of flies vastly outweigh all the other insect orders. As you can see from <clears throat> this little graph uh, pie chart showing the, the distribution of the insects caught coming into Cyprus, the flies vastly outweigh everything else. And the roles that these insects play are fascinating. And if you look at this figure, again, adapted from my upcoming paper on migrants coming into Cyprus in the springtime, you can see that we have most of a functional ecosystem migrating through the air. 8% um, of these were pest predators, 22 decomposers, 48% were pest species, 77 huge amount were pollinators, yet all of them were nutrient transfers. And so let's very briefly, a bit conscious of time, we'll have a look at the two of the most important roles these insects play. Firstly, pollination. And insect migrants are really important for pollination because they move the pollen such vast distances. They allow for the gene flow between plant populations, which would otherwise remain completely unconnected to, remain, to become, um, allow the gene flow. And here is a photo of a common drone fly, which I caught having just migrated across the sea from the Middle East, 109 kilometers, 108 kilometers away, with orchid pollen, orchid pollenia on its face. And we swabbed various individuals and found that some hoverflies were carrying seven different species of pollen. And they were carrying it from Asia in the Middle East into Europe, so that's cross-continental pollination, which is a fairly good tagline. Um, but also this long range transfer of pollen to the same species of flowering plants has the real potential to increase levels of genetic diversity 
and gene flow between plant populations, as I said, that would otherwise remain unconnected. And this dispersal of pollen can introduce new genes into the plant populations, potentially rescuing these populations, which may be in decline by promoting offspring fitness, for example, as well as reducing the effects of inbreeding depression as well as the continued upkeep of healthy populations. But perhaps the most important role that the migratory insects play is, least, is the least known, and that is transferring nutrients. Because the insects are multi-generational migrants, when they get into an area they want to lay their eggs, they'll die and their nutrients will return to the soil or the general environment. And the nutrients contained within the insects is a large amount of phosphorus and nitrogen, as I'm sure you'll know, is vital for plant growth. And if you consider the huge numbers these insects are migrating in, the three and a half trillion across just southern England, and how many more there be across the whole of Europe, for example, as well as the fact that these movements are regular and seasonal, bringing nutrients into an area, um, and especially in areas further north, vast swathes of the vegetation Northern Europe, for example, may actively rely on this influx of nutrients bought by the insects in order to bloom or maybe survive completely. And then consider the other hugely important ecological roles that these insects play, the pollination, the pest control, decomposition, etc. And you have a massive and completely vital natural phenomena that is thus far relatively unstudied. However, <clears throat> these insects are under threat. Right, so a recent study from Germany, from a guy named Gatter, he looked at hoverfly numbers migrating through uh, Alpine Pass for the last 50 years or so. And he's found that the numbers that were migrating 50 years ago to the numbers today that we're seeing coming through the mountains in the same area, <clears throat> they're now counting just 3%. 3%, a reduction of 97% of the insects that were once migrating through uh, just around today. And this is um, uh, seen across Europe. So one of my friends and colleagues, Miles, Miles Ment, he works in um, the Swiss Alps and he's seeing, did a very, very similar study across 50 years and he's seeing very, very similar numbers. <clears throat> and in fact, our counts compared to the Lacks counts, David and Elizabeth Lack, um, well, 70 years ago is again very similar. But there is still a sunrise of hope. To keep these insects performing such vital roles, we need to take notice of them more. And it was David Attenborough that said fairly recently, what you don't know, you cannot love. And I think that's so important. So notice in a month ago, when the hoverflies are back in your garden, the red admirals, the cabbage whites even, and the dragonflies, um, take notice of them and admire just how amazing these insects have been to make such huge journeys and the incredible roles that they play and using less pesticides, buying organic, providing native flowers as food for these insects and we can all help save these most remarkable migrants. Now I'd like to thank all of these people um, for uh, all the help they've given me, definitely couldn't have done anything without them. And here is a final slide just showing general social, so my own Twitter, as well as the lab Twitter, keep up to date on everything that we're doing, Instagram, a couple of websites, and then me and my friend Ben's a fairly daft wildlife podcast that we're doing at the moment. But yes, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Will. That was a really, really, really beautiful talk. Um, and it's just generally fantastic to hear about things that probably don't cross our minds half as enough. Um, so again, as again, if anyone has any questions, please pop them into the chat or, or, or raise, raise yourselves to my awareness. Um, and whilst you all do that, I have, a, I have a question around. So you were talking about the, the globe skimmers going from, from India subcontinent into, into sort of Eastern Africa, Southern Eastern Africa. Do you think that's the, the single longest stint that any insect probably does in one um in one individual lifetime yeah yeah i think so but there's potential for it to be even longer right there's these globe skimmers are amazing creatures they did a study <clears throat> so there's a fairly complicated thing called um isotopic um research which is basically the 
we use hydrogen isotopes, an isotope is a type of hydrogen element, and it varies. Like 99% are uh, the hydrogen 1 isotope, but there's a second which is called deuterium hydrogen 2, and that type of isotope varies with uh, rainfall. And so basically, you can use it uh, as a map. The amount of hydrogen isotope 2 varies across geographic space. Mm -hmm. That means that you can, um, yeah, you can, and because insects often need water, especially with the dragonflies, they'll develop in standing water. <clears throat> you can really use it as a map because the, the deuterium goes into their bodies. And so there's been some amazing studies looking at the whole world and as well as genetic studies. And these globe skimmers are thought to be a global panmictic population. So the whole population of the entire globe is potentially able to mix. Oh, and there's some uh, so ones in Mexico are the same as the ones in Australia, pretty much. And there's some, there was a, uh, the Bikini Atoll in uh, just miles off the coast in the Pacific. After it, it was used as a nuclear testing site in the like, 40s and 50s. And, and then, so everything was wiped out, but it was these dragonflies, which are the first ones to get back. And there are likely to be some that have made it right across the Pacific Ocean, maybe not in a, a, a regular seasonal um, migratory loop like the ones in um, the ones in the Indian Ocean do. But yeah, it's just absolutely unreal the distances they're going. That is, that is absolutely incredible that they managed to just go. It's one thing to sort of go from one point of land to another, but just out into the Pacific Ocean as well. It's such a vast expanse. And it's all, yeah, it's, they definitely, we don't think they know, they're not aiming for a specific location. They're just, land like birds might be, they're just kind of taking a risk. <laughs> it's the risk-taking individuals that if they fly, I don't know, northeast or whatever, then eventually they'll get to somewhere else. And so many must just <laughs> go off into the sea and be eaten by a whale or something. But no, the rest of them, yeah, it's just incredible how they've managed to do it. Cool. Well, we've got a couple of questions. So, uh, Christoph, if you'd like to fire away. Um, hi, hi, all. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Chris. Cool. Hi. Uh, thanks for talking. It was really, really cool. Um, I have a question. So, talking about uh, the nutrient transfer, when these individuals come in and they die, they like bodies decay, they add nutrients to the environment. Is the benefit of that then lost when like they the next generation like grow up and then take the nutrients with them to the next location? Um, or is it like some places gain from that process and, and while other places lose out? Or is it, are they like bringing in excess nutrients, nutrients from there, from somewhere that is a net gain to, to the, to the ecosystem? I think in a lot of, I think it really varies, right? And I think the, the whole ecosystem is in a sort of state of flux um, because the, it may be that the plants will have the adults coming in and then, but then in turn, the larvae will rely on the, the plants growing. Um, and, but yeah, it's, it's a, I'd love for it to be more highly studied because it really is very recently that we're finding out these insects are happening such huge numbers. So Jason's paper came out in 2016 and that was the first sort of huge numbers of insects that are coming across. We had no idea before that. Um, but yes, I, I don't know exactly, but I'd accept, expect that in some areas, yes, um, and some areas, so if it's really cold um, in, I don't know, in the frosty north of Sweden or whatever, or so in Sweden where it gets too cold over winter for many winter, uh, for many insects to overwinter, uh, the vast majority of insects will be migratory coming into the area, which means that all the, like, there will be a massive flux of insects and nutrients coming in, whereas potentially somewhere like southern France, there'll be less. Um, as you can tell by my answer, I'm not really sure, but it's something that we'd really like to, to answer. Is, is it perhaps like the number that migrate northwards is more than the number that migrating southwards? So you get a net benefit that way for the north, but it the way around. Maybe? I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's certainly not as um, <clears throat> as strict as I kind of made it out to be. So what we found in Cyprus was really interesting. There was like two uh, 
two waves really of these insects. So when we arrived first, we were in the middle of this huge wave of insects coming through. And then another month went past with ve really very little. And then another wave came from the same place. And so it could be, so, but in the autumn, they, there doesn't seem to be multiple waves. They all just kind of go at the same time or a similar time. Um, but yeah, so <clears throat> I would say that more are moving up because they have more food around and because it's the spring blooming. And so I reckon more, if I had to like reckon, I'd say that more are bringing nutrients to the north than there are into the south, but it's not a great difference. But yeah, great question. And <laughs> something I really want to answer. <laughs> so future research is always exciting. Thank you. I'll, I'll pass on to, well, back to Josh and then. Um, I think yeah, I think also we'll, we'll squeeze one more in. Um, Helen has a question, and then we'll uh, then we'll crack on. Cool. Hi, Will. Yeah, that was really good. Um, I was just wondering. Obviously, ninety-seven percent decline is massive and like actually quite scary in terms of like our food production and stuff. Um, I was wondering, is there anything that like particularly threatens migra migrating insects over non-migrants? And like, is there anything that we can do to protect <coughs> migrating ones particularly or anything? So migratory insects are, one, they're kind of the ones which could have the great, uh, a massive comeback because they are really generalist and that's why they, I think why they can migrate is because they can find food anywhere. And we found that, so in Cyprus, one of the insects species, which was a, made up nearly 44% of all the 50 million ones were a single species of, um, uh, bean seed fly a tiny little fly which is a pest and that um just needs crop plants basically but uh, the so yes what could they're difficult as well because if you've got you can't just have a single uh single nature reserve say on the lizard or something because they go such great distances and so i think the thing that will help them is changing farming methods away from pesticides because it's the farm farming which allows these great swathes of Europe to be suitable for insects to land on and we saw in uh, there was one of the photos earlier just a beautiful wildflower meadow and that was in Cyprus where they use really like um sort of old school methods instead of the monocultures you find across vast swathes of Europe and so I think the key will be um, reducing pesticide use. But, and if we do that, I went to this farming conference last year and they were all saying how they, they're all slowly swapping to seeing the use of these insects because like all the pest controls, so all the hoverflies we see, the vast majority eat aphids and so they're vital for um, reducing pests um, on the crops. And so, and because they've got so, I mean, a single hoverfly can lay up to like almost a thousand eggs or something. And so they can really recover really quickly. We just need to stop hammering them with pesticides, but also providing um, flower rich resources in our gardens as well for them. But yeah, no, it's a good question. Thank you. Oh, great, thanks. Cool. Thank you very much, Will. And again, if anyone has any questions or thinks of them as they, um, as they come, uh, we will, uh, Will can um, <clears throat> respond to them in the chat or we can come back to them at the end. Um, cool, thank you very much, Will. So with that, we will move on uh, to our third talk of the evening. And our third talk is from Jenny. Um, Jenny Grigg is also a PhD student at the Centre for Ecology and Conservation. And she is part of the Marine Predator Ecology and Conservation Group. Um, and Jenny works with African penguins. So she started her work with African penguins about 10 years ago. And so is very, very well placed to give us an expert appraisal and I'm looking very forward to it. So without further ado, over to you, Jenny. Thanks, let me try and uh, share my screen. Okay. Has that worked? Can you see? Yeah, you're grand. Awesome, okay. Okay, sorry, bear with me. So um, yeah, wow, what a talk to follow, that was amazing. Um, so I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so talking to you about something from South Africa. Um, it's not the variant of coronavirus that we've heard a lot about recently, don't worry. 
it's the African penguin. So I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of the problems faced by the penguins, but also some of the work conducted by myself and others at the University of Exeter to try and tackle their decline. So if I asked you to think about a penguin, you'd probably imagine snowy, icy scenes like the ones in the pictures here. And if I asked you to think about penguins in Africa, these animated characters might be the first things that came into your head. But in fact, Africa is home to its own real species of penguin, appropriately named the African penguin. So the African penguin is found only in Southern Africa and it breeds in three distinct regions. So Namibia and in the Eastern and Western Cape of South Africa. And so there are about 28 African penguin colonies, most of which are on offshore islands, but a few of which are on land. And these birds predominantly eat small pelagic fish, anchovy and sardine. Um, unfortunately, over the course of the last century, the African penguin has undergone a dramatic population decline. And it's really uh, well illustrated by these two photos you can see here. So in the 1930s, there were more than 300,000 breeding pairs, um, the global population estimated. But then by the 1970s, it seemed that there were less than 70,000 breeding pairs. And this decline was largely driven by the collection of eggs and by the removal of guano, which the penguins used to make burrows in to avoid the heat. Um, this downward trend has continued. So the plot on the left shows how the population has continued to decline past the late 70s. Um, African penguins were declared endangered in 2010. Um, and in 2020, there are only an estimated 17,000 pairs left in the wild. Um, and this represents an almost 95% reduction in population size. So just alluding to what Will was saying in the, in the previous talk, there's obviously a bit of a, a trend going on here with uh, global biodiversity. Um, so this decline that we've seen more recently has been driven by slightly different things. So not egg collection and guano scraping. So this decline has largely been due to changes in the availability of the African penguin's main food source, sardine and anchovy. Um, so you can see from the maps here on the right, sardine and anchovy are not only declining, but they're also moving eastwards away from the colonies on the west coast, which were previously the African penguin stronghold. And this appears to be due to changes in the temperature and salinity of the ocean driven by climate change. So on top of this, the African penguin has to compete with commercial fisheries that also target these pelagic fish species. Um, so all in all, this paints quite a bleak picture. Um, so what have we been doing about it? Well, it can be really difficult to directly demonstrate that fishing contributes to the decline of marine predators. But since 2008, a project has been underway to do this and to provide evidence that closing the areas around penguin colonies to fishing will benefit penguins. So this is work led by my supervisor, Richard Shirley, and scientists in South Africa that I was very lucky to work on as part of my master's. Um, so to explain a bit about how the experiment works. So since 2008, at two separate pairs of colonies, uh, Robin Island and Dusk Island in the Western Cape and Bird Island and St. Croix Island in the Eastern Cape, local fish enclosures, which are represented by the uh, white dashed lines around the colonies, have been alternated within each pair of colonies. So while one colony within the pair of islands is closed to fishing, the other one acts as a control and is left open to fishing. And then after a period of time, the closures are alternated within each pair of islands. So during the period of this experiment at all islands, penguin foraging behavior and the condition and survival of penguin chicks was measured. And changes in these parameters were used to infer whether preventing fishing was beneficial. So in terms of what the results told us, well, although the results weren't consistent across all sites, quite clearly when closures were in place, more penguin chicks survived and chick body condition was better than in non-closure years. And more importantly, these positive changes were enough to increase the modeled population growth rate by more than 1% compared to a population modeled with the baseline level of chick condition and survival. And this is important because it passes a threshold at which a management intervention is deemed to be biologically significant. So although these results are great, the population modeling overall showed that the closures weren't sufficient to reverse the population declines. Um, but preventing, obviously preventing fishing around the penguin colonies only protects the birds when they are actually at the colonies. 
Um, while they're breeding, African penguins generally stay within about 20 to 40 kilometers of the colony as they need to stay close to feed their chicks. Um, and you can see in this map here, um, this shows where penguins from, uh, uh, from Robben Island spend most of their time foraging during the breeding season, um, how close they stay. But what about when they're not breeding and before they start to breed? Um, in marine predators like penguins, we actually know really little about what young individuals do before they begin to breed because they spend most of their time at sea. So they're really difficult to actually track and follow. Um, but understanding what they do is so important because if these young individuals fail to survive, then this can negatively affect the population. So in other work conducted by Rich Shirley, African penguins were tagged with uh, GPS tracking devices to reveal where they go when they leave the colony they were born at for the first time. And the results that we've got from this are fascinating, but also scary. So in the map here, you can see the colonies in the colored filled circles. I'll try and show you with my mouse. Um, and the loops show the areas that the birds target when they leave. Um, so you can see here, for instance, a chick that fledges from Dasan Island, travels all the way up here into Namibia to forage. And I thought that was a really long way until I heard the, what some of the dragonflies do. <laughs> But these fledglings essentially travel hundreds of kilometers to target areas that were previously hot spots for pelagic fish, but have since become degraded, meaning they're traveling extremely far to find food that's no longer there. And this can have a really severe impact on their survival. So as part of this work, population projection models um, were run and these suggested that the number of breeding pairs is now 50% lower than it would have been if the birds weren't targeting these degraded areas. Um, for the young individuals that do survive the journey and then return, um, they often come back to the colonies as one to two year olds before setting out again for sea. Um, and like before, understanding where these teenage birds go is really important to make sure we can protect these areas. And this is something that I'm trying to understand with my PhD. And in 2019, I tracked these one to two year old immature individuals from three colonies in the Western Cape to determine their spatial distribution at sea. Later this year, we're hoping to deploy some more devices on birds from these areas in the Western Cape and some of the colonies in the Eastern Cape. I will, uh, we'll see with coronavirus, we weren't able to do field work last year. Um, and although I've yet to analyze the results fully, from the map shown in the center, it's clear that the immature penguins continue to target areas away from the breeding colonies. So it's clear that um, restrictions on breeding around uh, colonies won't be sufficient to protect that age class. Um, although they don't travel as far north as the younger birds, possibly indicating that they're learning. So one more thing that I'm trying to work on as part of my PhD is to understand whether African penguins are able to change where they breed. A lot of what we've spoken about before has been where they go and forage to find food rather than the breeding colonies they choose. So you remember that pelagic fish are moving eastwards what if penguins were just able to change colony and instead breed when there are more fish? That would make complete sense. However, many seabird species are so faithful to their own colony that they will continue to breed at the same site again and again, even if conditions deteriorate to the point that they've got reduced survival. So a major population monitoring program has been underway in South Africa since 2013, whereby individuals at the key colonies, you can see highlighted here on the map, have been marked as passive integrated transponders. And these are just like the microchips that you put into cats and dogs. And then these chips can be read using handheld readers like the yellow lightsaber device you see in the photo on the left. And with readers that are set up at the entrance to colonies that automatically detect the chip numbers. So I've just used the data from this monitoring program to look at whether African penguins change colonies and whether this allows them to adapt to the changes in prey availability. So my results have shown that once they begin to breed, African penguins do in fact return to the same colony year after year. So regardless of whether the conditions decline, the overwhelming majority of individuals will continue to return to the same colony. But for young individuals that have yet to breed, a small proportion and around 10% will choose to breed in a different colony other than the ones they were born at. So this suggests that penguins may have some flexibility to adapt to changing conditions, but at this level, it probably won't be enough to mitigate any population decline. Um, so I've spoken a lot about a lot of different research that's gone on over the last kind of 10, 15 years or so. Um, and now I kind of want to talk a little bit about how we can use this information and, and how we can reverse the population trend. So we've demonstrated that fishing closures around colonies work. So we 
we need now permanent spatial protection around breeding colonies, but we also need protection in those other areas that we've identified as important for other age classes. So as well as my work to track immature foraging behaviour, there's also ongoing work being carried out by Bird Lifestyle Africa to understand where adults go when they aren't breeding. And together, this information will help us guide where marine protected areas should be placed best so that they are ecologically meaningful for all age classes. There's also some really great work being done by BirdLife South Africa, in particular Christina Hagen, to create a brand new colony closer to where there's better prey availability. So these penguins here in the picture on the left are in fact concrete decoys that have been set out on the new colony to try and encourage the penguins to breed there. They're not just very relaxed penguins in the office. Um, and there are also plans to release the new penguin fledglings at this site in the hope that they will return to breed. And ultimately, we need better management of fisheries. Um, so to end, there'll be lots of challenges ahead, but hopefully through the information that we gain from the research we've conducted and with a bit of political will, the African penguin will continue to occupy the beaches and the islands and the oceans of South Africa for many generations to come. And with that, I want to just acknowledge all of the scientists and collaborators who've produced a lot of the work I've alluded to this evening and who've worked with me on the stuff that I've been doing, and also to the organizations that have funded or been involved in these projects. So I'll leave you with this video, which just gives a little glimpse into some of the work in the field we do to get these results, and also to the hidden lives of the African penguin. And thanks for listening. The video should just be 20 seconds or so. Fabulous, we can just have that playing along in the background. Thank you for that, Jenny, that's, that's really, really cool. Um, while we wait for questions to come in, I, I'll, start us, I'll start us off. Um, so with these translocations, do you think it would be more likely that immature individuals would, would translocate better than adults? You think adults are just so sight faithful, they just swim all the way back home and, and ignore wherever they've been left? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any chance that, that any adult birds reloc uh, relocated to the new site would actually stay. Um, they've actually kind of done an unintentional um, experiment <laughs> of that. So during the year 2000, there was a really, really awful oil spill, the treasure oil spill, whereby a massive proportion of the African penguin population was actually brought into rehabilitation to be de-oiled. And a massive um, group of individuals were also removed so that they wouldn't be caught by the oil when it reached them. And they were taken further up the coast, uh, the coast and then released. And all of those individuals then made their way back down to their colony. So although the young individuals um, might return, breeding adults will definitely just go back to where they've, where they've come from. Yeah, that's, that's crazy when you think about if, if they're, where they've come from has got to the point where there's not enough food for them to really thrive and you could drop them off somewhere where there's loads of fish and they just swim away from it all. <laughs> But such is such is the uh, one of them. So, how how successful do you think these translocations of immature individuals are going to be? What sort of time scale are we looking at to to sort of make a, a meaningful? Because I mean, I don't know how many are being moved every year or what or what the plans are if this is successful. It's really difficult. So they haven't yet done any translocations of fledgling. So they'll probably start that within the next year or so, and then release. I'm not sure how many they're planning on releasing each year, maybe a hundred or so each year, because um, fledgling African penguins are released into the wild anyway, every year as they're taken in for rehabilitation. Um, but the decoys have been out for a while. It, it's, and they, it's not been established yet. It's quite difficult with seabirds because they are so sight, a lot of them are so sight faithful, but fingers crossed. Good stuff, cool. Um, I've got a question here from Morag. It says, there are many types of seabirds suffering from changing sea temperatures and movement of fish and food, e.g. puffins. Is your research being used to inform management for other species? So I think so at the moment, a lot of what I'm doing is only applicable to the African penguin in terms of kind of the work I'm doing on immatures and the location of where we should place marine protected areas. Um, but the by being able to compare the data we have on foraging behaviour of juveniles immatures and adults will be really useful to compare um, to compare make comparisons with other species because really we don't have a lot of information about immature seabird behavior so anything that we can get will be really useful to make comparisons for other species yeah yeah of course 
I mean, in terms of the the areas that your your penguins use, I'm assuming there are lots of other seabirds that also use those areas and therefore would benefit from the protection as, as well as just the penguins. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, there's quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I don't see any other questions for now. So again, as everyone, as always, if you put your questions in the chat, I'm sure Jenny would be more than happy to answer them. But um, I'll say thank you again for, for a great talk, Jenny, and we'll move on to our, our final talk of the evening. So... Oh, no, one, one question just popped up. Well, I've still got you. I'll, I'll, I'll shoot it in. Um, the question is from Alberto and says, how do penguins remember where their colonies are, even if they're 500 kilometres away? That's a really good question. <laughs> one that I'm not quite sure of the answer to. I, yeah, I'm really not sure, but who knows? It would be great to find out because that would help the translocations be much more successful, I'm sure. One things we can't know. Uh, fantastic cool well thank you very much jenny um and we will move on to our last talk of the evening so our last talk is from dr joe browse who is a lecturer um in physical geography at the at the campus here um, and she researches cloud formation at the poles and works with complex computational models to determine how clouds and climate at the poles will change um, and joe gave a fantastic interactive talk last year at our event and i'm very excited to see what she's got for us this evening so without further ado i'll hand over to you joe thank you very much um, so thank you for hanging on until now. I know people are busy even in lockdown. Um, I am something of the odd one out this evening. I am going to be talking about meteorology, although I have to say there are connections uh, between what I do and uh, the ecology departments as well. So I'm going to try and just share my screen. Um, so my talk this evening is on why clouds matter. Um, I spend a lot of my life looking at clouds and studying clouds and understanding clouds. And I think personally, they are one of the most important aspects of the atmosphere and of the global system as well. Now, I said there were links. Um, obviously, Darwin is very much known for uh, his work with genetics, but he actually traveled on the Beagle and uh, I believe in the uh, introduction we discussed how the Beagle actually came to Falmouth which is amazing but actually the captain of the Beagle was a man called Robert Fitzroy um, very very talented scientist and a great friend of Darwin and he actually went on to create the first synoptic weather forecasts and he also founded the UK Met Office uh, which uh, was founded in 1854 I believe and actually has been working now for about 150 years um, and one of the reasons why he actually did continue as a meteorologist and um, wrote an excellent book called The Weather Book, which is actually a forecasting manual. And if you are a, uh, at home at the moment or you're with children and you're doing homeschooling, it's a great resource, got lots of really kind of interesting experiments you can do actually at home and uh, create weather things. Um, so if uh, it's OK, I might put a link to that in the chat afterwards if people want to play around. So clouds are interesting for lots and lots of reasons. Um, my interest as a weather forecaster, and I was a weather forecaster for some time, is they do tell you a great deal about the weather situation and also a lot more than you might think about um, not just the weather actually, but the atmospheric uh, composition of the climate, sorry, the, <laughs> the atmospheric composition. So this is a, a, a really good pro uh, pro proverb, I believe it's called, uh, when clouds appear like rocks and towers, earth's refreshed with frequent showers. These sort of uh, rhymes about weather are really common and uh, they're often true. And this one is definitely true. And actually it's referring to what we call a cumulonimbus cloud, one like this, a very large storm cloud, which will generally produce rain. But there are many, many different uh, types of cloud and a lot of them can tell you a great deal about what the weather is going to be. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's called a mammatus cloud. Um, mammatus clouds are actually extremely rare. Um, what you find uh, or you see are these sort of bulbous clouds reaching down from, uh, um, so they look like little, I guess little, my, my friend always calls them little testes and they do, to be honest. They're quite rare actually, um, and they are indicative of a very, very uh, strong storm system. Uh, they're usually coming from cumulonimbus and I have to say we don't quite know exactly how they form. There are a few uh, um, theories, um, mainly surrounding turbulence and storm systems, but we do know that if you see these sort of clouds, and they do come in various different forms, uh, you're going to have a lot of rain and a lot of stormy weather. 
Another one I really like are gravity waves. These are gravity waves. They're very, very high level clouds, uh, usually within the top of the strat top of the troposphere or in even into the stratosphere. And actually gravity waves indicate where energy is entering the stratosphere. So the stratosphere is normally it's a large area um, above the troposphere. It's usually quite a calm area of the atmosphere fairly stable, very low pressure, not a lot goes on there. For a weather forecaster like myself, pretty boring. I've got to be honest, not a lot going on. But when you, um, when energy enters the stratosphere, and it can do if there's a particularly strong storm, or uh, you get uplift over mountains as well, you often get these things, what we call gravity waves, where this is an indication that energy, and particularly humidity is entering the stratosphere. And what that means is the stratosphere is going to get warmer. And what that means for us is that things like the polar vortex are going to um, start to weaken. And this is where air is falling into the poles. And on a very basic level, it means we're going to have bad weather. So when you see gravity waves, usually within about a week or so, we're probably going to have bad weather. This is one of my favorites. It's very, very rare, unfortunately. It's called lenticular cloud. Um, lenticular clouds uh, are often, uh, they look like uh, UFOs, they look like flying saucers, and there are lots of series that people who have seen them do think they've seen a UFO. Um, they're actually formed by orographic processes, so what happens is air masses that have lots of uh, um, water inside them are, are, are raised, they're uplifted as they go over mountains, and uh, they uh, condense out the water. The water contents out and you get these quite extraordinary saucer-like forms on the top of mountains. You do get them on Mount Fuji quite a lot in Japan, so if you ever are in Japan that's one of your best places to see them, but I have to say they are quite rare. However, my favourite cloud, if I can have a favourite, is what I call the Nasserus cloud. This is a Nasserus cloud. Um, they're polar stratospheric clouds, very, very high clouds, usually seen in Antarctica. And this is actually a picture from the McMurdo base um, taken by a friend of mine uh, about two years ago, I think now. Now, Nasserus clouds are um, very, very beautiful, as you can see. Uh, you get this diffusive light through and this sort of almost like an oil sheen is how I would describe it in the atmosphere. But they are also really an interesting indication of uh, climate and weather. Um, Nasserus clouds form when the stratosphere is incredibly cold. It has to be about minus 80 degrees for the, the Nasserus clouds to start to form. And when they do start to form, uh, they actually interact with ozone in the stratosphere. And when you have Nasserus clouds, you generally have an ozone hole over Antarctica. Um, and this is uh, came to my attention quite a lot this week, and I wanted to put it up because Paul Crutzen, who is the uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, discoverer or one of the discoverers of the of the ozone hole, among other things, including the, the coining of the term Anthropocene, he unfortunately died last week. Um, if you didn't know, not of COVID, I believe, um, but uh, one of his greatest works was this discussion of Nasserus clouds and how they interact with ozone. So. Those are various forms of cloud that we are interested in because they tell us a great deal about the world we're living in, which is wonderful. But we also care about clouds um, because they have an incredibly important impact on our climate. Clouds are very, very bright. Um, they're very white, they're very fluffy, most of them, um, and they reflect a considerable amount of sunlight. This is, um, I'm not going to show very many plots in this, don't worry, um, but this is uh, our sort of our best understanding of energy systems in the climate. So what we have on here with the yellow is the incoming radiation from the sun and the orange here is the outgoing radiation um, from the surface. And actually we think slightly less than a third of all of the sunlight that gets to the earth is actually reflected by clouds. Um, clouds themselves, uh, they usually about they usually cover about 40% of the ocean surface, and they do actually have an equivalent um, kind of brightness or albedo to sea ice and uh, snow. And maybe you've heard of this, the, what we call the ice albedo feedback, where we lose the cryosphere, we're losing the, Ar the Arctic sea ice, we're losing the Arctic snow and glaciers, and glaciers, and that's having a major impact on temperature. Clouds do have a similar effect, um, and they're very, very important. And unfortunately, um, we don't know a lot about them. There's a huge uncertainty about them. And a lot of that is to do with how clouds actually form. Um, 
So clouds form, you may have heard in school, like this. Um, the sun heats the ground where there's water. Uh, the water evaporates. It rises up into the atmosphere, which is what we call convection. And uh, when it gets to a certain height, it's cold enough that it starts to condense out into rain droplets. Um, I see a few nods, which is excellent. This is what people generally consider clouds, how clouds form. It is unfortunately a complete lie. I'm gonna tell you that now. Um, in the fact, there's actually no truth to it whatsoever. Most things that you learn in school do have a certain truth, but this one, no, no, this is not how clouds form. Uh, to do this process, um, you would need what we call a supersaturation of roughly 20%. Um, and that means that the air is holding 20% more water than it physically can um, when you take it to colder temperatures. Supersaturations in the atmosphere rarely get above 0 0.5. This does not happen. It's what we call homogeneous nucleation, and it's a process that doesn't happen. Um, this is where we are doing a bit of interactive thing. I do have a little... Um, tape of this <laughs> as well, uh, in case it doesn't work, because often it doesn't. Um, but you can actually make a cloud at home, and I fully encourage you to do so. You just need a plastic bottle and an aerosol source. So aerosol in the atmosphere, I'm going to quickly go to my YouTube, um, That's okay. comes from a lot of different sources, but aerosol is basically particles. Turn off the sound on that. Um, aerosols are basically particles and they come from lots and lots of sources in the atmosphere. Some of them natural, quite a lot of them anthropogenic. Um, this is a fantastic little uh, sort of animation of aerosol as we um, model it. Um, the white, are, so these sort of white things that are coming off, that's sulfates, they're very important. Um, a lot of them come from our emissions, but you also get a lot from uh, natural sources as well, including the ocean. And um, the red here is dust, lots and lots of dust in the atmosphere. The biggest source is Sahara, it's the Sahara Desert. Um, and you actually find Saharan desert dust actually does get to um, here in the UK. It actually makes it to the Arctic as well sometimes, if the circumstances are right. Um, we also have sea salt, which are these sort of blue, plumy things that are coming off. Um, and at forest fires as well, biomass burning. Um, across the world, significant sources of aerosol. And aerosol is very, very difficult um, to study uh, because it comes from so many sources um, and because it's very difficult to determine where things come from um, and also how much of an impact we may have had on them in the future. But what I will say is that without aerosol, you cannot make clouds. Um, they basically form the nucleus of the cloud droplets. It's much, much easier for the water to, co to condense on an existing particle than it is to create a new particle from water vapor. So we cheat, basically. Um, you can actually do this yourself, and I'm gonna try and do it now um, from my screen. So you need a plastic bottle, as I said, um, fill it with water. Um, best way as well is to empty it slightly this way round and then put the lid back on when it's um, pouring out. That way, what you've got is a space in your um, plastic bottle. There's a lot of water vapor in there because uh, the water, you'll have a lot of um, evaporation at the water's surface, but there's not really much else in there. And when I do that, which is basically changing the pressure within the bottle, you'll notice that there's really no difference. Um, nothing happens. When I do that. Now we're gonna introduce some aerosol. There's a couple of options for this, and I'm gonna do two to show you, but actually aerosol comes from loads and loads of sources. Um, one of the best ways, I'm gonna try and do this on the sofa, sorry, is with a match. Um, so smoke- All right, Joe, one second. Um, can I, I've just had a couple of people asking, maybe if you could stop sharing your screen whilst you do this, just so you come up in big. That's a very good idea. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, I'm gonna try and do this. I do have a backup. I have a little video of me doing it as well. So if you take a match, You take it out and pop it in, try and get some smoke particles in there. The other thing I'm gonna do is use good old hairspray. Um, this actually has 
uh, things like limonene in and benzines. And actually these, what we call volatile chemicals are really important for aerosol as well. So, let me put, there we go. And now we're gonna close it up again. So we've now got some aerosol in the bottle. And hopefully, maybe you can't see it very well. You can now see every time I do that, it goes opaque. And it's water droplets. Can, can we, yep, I see Josh is good. <laughs> We've noticed it. Um, so that's water droplets. They're now forming within the bottle. And the reason they can do that is because um, there are now aerosol particles, be it from the hairspray or be it from the smoke particles, they're allowing the cloud to actually form. Um, that's my experiment. Please do try it at home. It's quite fun. <laughs> Again, if you've got kids, it's a, it's a good one to, to play with as well. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again. Cool. So, um, as I said, clouds need aerosol. They will not form unless there are particles in the atmosphere. Um, and uh, as I said, do try that on to, to prove to yourself that, you, you, that, that, that that is the case. But aerosols also have a major effect because we obviously produce a lot of aerosol. This is a smog um, from, I think, over LA. Uh, we produce huge amounts of chemicals that go into the atmosphere. Some of them are what we call primary particles, so smog, um, uh, what you would call PM maybe if you're thinking about air quality. But we also produce lots of things like SO2, um, sulfur dioxide, sorry, and other kind of gases in the atmosphere that produce these things in the, uh, in the, um, in the atmosphere. And that has had a major impact. Um, and that's because clouds and aerosol interactions are really important. When you have lots of aerosol in the atmosphere, what happens is this, so it's working now, but you'll get lots and lots of droplets, but the more kind of particles you have, and therefore the more um, what I call cloud seeds or cloud droplet seeds you have, the more droplets you have in the cloud. And that makes them much, much brighter. It's what we call the Tommy effect um, after the person who actually uh, created it or, or discovered it. Um, and this impact actually cools the planet. So when you uh, are emitting huge amounts of aerosol into the atmosphere or particles into the atmosphere, you're having an effect which is contrary to CO2. So CO2 is warming, hopefully, the atmosphere, if you're aware of that, it's warming the atmosphere um, by absorbing long wave radiation. But clouds, by becoming brighter as we enter the industrial period, have been cooling it. And one of the biggest questions in climate science is just how much they have. Because one of the things we want to do, or what, we, what we're interested in, is um, seeing the difference between what we call the pre-industrial and now. And that's how we determine how important CO2 is and how it's going to change into the future. Um, but one of our biggest issues is understanding that. Um, this is really the only plot I have. Uh, it's my last slide as well. <laughs> I'm sure you'd be happy to know. Um, this is from the IPCC report and I'm going to go through it, don't worry. Um, these are what we call radiative forcing. So what it means is basically how much energy is being trapped that shouldn't be trapped in the atmosphere. And at the bottom um, we have a the, the red lines which are the totals and we've got 1950, which is basically um, prior to the pre-industrial, how much energy is being trapped in 1950, 1980, and more important to us, 2011. So you can see here, it's two watts per meter squared, but that's sort of the excess energy that we're currently trapping in the atmosphere and, and in the Earth system. It's the reason why it's warming up. Now, the majority of that comes from this brown bar, which is the CO2 effect. So we've push CO2 emissions beyond a natural values, which were roughly about 350 to way over 400 now. And that impact is a warming impact, a radiative forcing um, of the climate. However, there's quite a lot of things in the climate and they have different effects, as I said. And the big one is this gray line here. So these are at the top are all the greenhouse gases. In the middle are other greenhouse gases that are less important, but still having an effect. And then at the bottom are these aerosol precursors and cloud effects. And the gray one here is the cloud adjustment due to aerosols. It's negative, 
So we know there's probably been a cooling effect due to that. But the key thing is the error bar, because the error bar pretty much tells you what, how much we know about it. And the error bar here is much, much larger than the actual gray bar itself. And what that indicates is that we have very little knowledge of what the clouds have done. And what I will say is the error bar on the 2011 forcing here, you'll see is also quite high. It's ranging there from about one to up to three watts per meter squared. So pretty significant error on there. And almost all of that, I would say, or at least up to 80% of it is due to our lack of understanding as to this impact on clouds. And also our lack of understanding as to what clouds are gonna do in the future as well. Um, so that's why I study clouds and why I'm very interested in clouds. Um, I'm very happy to take questions. And I, as I say, I will, I will pop that uh, um, link to Fitzroy's manual, which is a really interesting read as well. I don't know, I've been lecturing too much. I'm giving you reading, sorry. <laughs> you don't have to though. Uh, and as I say, very happy to take questions. I'm gonna stop sharing as well now. Um, Perfect. Thank you very much, Joe. I already you have a very interesting in the chat. People are appreciating clouds left, right and centre. Um, <laughs> while, while I get everyone's questions together, I've, I've got a, a question about the, the aerosols at the end. So we know that they they sometimes, well, they will hopefully cool via making more clouds form. But I suppose part of the problem we know is not just warming, but the, the changes in climate that happen as, as a result. So as some of these aerosols, if we release them in high, are going to cause more rain. And are those clouds with more aerosols denser and do they produce more rain? that might affect local areas or? This is a key question. Actually, it's quite the opposite. So we see the brightening effect. What happens when you have lots and lots of little droplets um, is they, they don't form rain droplets. So okay. actually the clouds are longer lived as well, we think. But I have to say the, the response is much more complicated than that. Um, it really depends on the cloud formation itself. So in a cumulonimbus uh, storm cloud, for example, um, it can actually enhance precipitation impacts um, by heating specific areas of the cloud. Um, there's also impacts of different composition as well, which I didn't get into, but um, different types of aerosol have differing effects on clouds. Some of them cause more droplets to form. Um, some of them have no impact whatsoever because they're what we call hydrophilic, so they don't really react with water. Um, and some of them actually make clouds freeze. And I didn't even get into freezing, but freezing is very cool because, again, yeah. freezing is um, one of those things you think you know or you've been told about at school, but everything you know is entirely wrong. Um, <laughs> freezing is a stochastic process, and it actually, is, which means the probability changes. And uh, in most clouds, you actually have what we call supercooled water, so water actually below uh, the freezing point. Okay. Oh, like we do with those demonstrations with those Fiji water bottles and then they hit them and they... Yeah. Yes, they're great fun to do. But actually, it's very easy to super, um, super cool water. Um, you need to get it to freeze. You actually need what we call an IN or an ice nuclei. Um, and the mechanisms behind why water freezes is actually a real mystery. Um, there are... Uh, <laughs> we're not 100% sure why ice forms. Ice is really weird when you think about it. It's a very strange substance. It's the only solid of a of a, of any substance that is actually lighter than its liquid form. So it floats on the liquid. Yeah. No yeah. other anything in the world acts like or the universe acts like that. The amount that exists and the amount that it has the ability to be studied is crazy. We still don't really have much of a much of an understanding. That's fantastic. Um, there's a question here from Morag who says, um, if the light is being reflected off the clouds, it suggests that the amount of light reaching the ground and therefore the plants it might be reducing. Is there any evidence that agriculture and plant productivity is being reduced? That's a fantastic question. And um, it's really interesting because you what we see with aerosol particularly is and clouds is they do reduce the amount of light that gets to the surface. And it's one of the key questions that comes up when people talk about geoengineering a lot. Um, and there is evidence that it would reduce plant productivity. But there is a secondary aspect to them, which is they increase light diffusity. So the, the light that gets through clouds is more scattered. Um, and 
also you see scattering between surfaces and clouds and also aerosol and surfaces and what that means is that the air the uh, sunlight is um, directed in lots of different directions rather than just the one and actually that makes photosynthesis more efficient so we actually see a diffusive light fertilization impact from aerosol certainly in the um, the mid-century um, that probably supersedes any reduction um, in the solar radiation incoming. Um, but again, there's a lot of questions on that one. Yeah, I imagine it's very specific, but that's 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 fascinating. Um, a general comment here from from Henry says, fascinating, all amazing, the research being done by Exodini. Thanks and thank you, Henry, for for, for coming along. Um, I suppose at, at this at this venture, I'll, I want to take a minute to just. Um, Oh, no, sorry, well, we've got one more question here while we're still with you, Joe. Um, Heather says, how would cloud seeding help? Raise me general. Uh, so this is a geoengineering technique that, and it, and it comes up quite a lot. Um, so what you would do is inject aerosol into the atmosphere and it would theoretically make the clouds brighter. Um, there are, however, a lot of questions on that, not least actually that it would be incredibly difficult to do. And probably not worth it. Um, what we see actually in clouds as well. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Sorry, I was looking at the chat. Um, <laughs> yes, good quote. Do you know I was looking for a cloud quote to finish? That should have been my cloud quote. That was yeah, very much better. Um, so yeah, it 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 would possibly work on quite a regional level. And cloud seeding actually is used um, to make rain. Um, in certain places, uh, it's actually technically illegal. Um, the UN actually have laws against weather tampering, as it's described, but they're not particularly enforced. So the Chinese government do it a lot. Um, the North Korean government do it a lot to um, get rid of clouds, because if you um, put certain species, particularly silver iodine is used quite a lot, it's extremely hydrophilic and can result in um, causing um, precipitation processes to happen um, and there is actually a few companies in the US that do it supposedly to stop rain on your wedding day and things like that but actually on a large scale <laughs> um, you need to for, to for the clouds to get brighter rather than to actually precipitate out you need a very specific size of particle very small um, so in my, microns size, if you get that wrong, you're actually more likely to disperse the cloud than you are to brighten it. The other aspect that is quite interesting as well is that it's not a linear effect in clouds. And there is a lot of evidence that we've actually sort of saturated the clouds at this point. We produce so much aerosol that if you add a little bit more, the cloud effect, it doesn't change that much. Um, and I do quite a lot of work on that in terms of historic aerosol, um, because it's really important to understand what had happened in the past so we can accurately predict sensitivity to CO2. Cool, fantastic. Yeah, that's, it's, we, I can imagine we've produced rather a lot of it over the... Over tons the and tons and tons. Last little while, <laughs> which, yeah, if it was going to have any effect, I reckon it would have, it would have seen it quite largely already. Fantastic. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, I'm going to take this opportunity to thank all of you guys for, for coming along. And I'm sure some of our speakers will be more than happy to, to hang around for a while. Um, and I'll, if someone asks her any questions, if you have any, would like to like to ask any follow-ups about any of our talks tonight. Um, thank you very much to the Cornwall Science Community for, for helping us host this event, especially to Ben Tolson for, for his kind help. And to uh, Amy and Toby, who are members of the organising committee here at the university who, have, who helped put this event on. Um, and, and finally, to our speakers who have given us their, their evenings to give us four fantastic talks so if you'd all join me in, in turning your microphones on and give them a little round of applause that'd be very very well uh, very well received thank you very much